Hello, hello. I believe at this point we are live. Woohoo! So I wanted to actually just uh, thank a couple people for jumping on originally, and I hope that you can hear us. Obviously, at this point, uh, we don't have anybody else that's jumped on the live feed with us. Uh, some scheduling things kind of caught people with their work schedules. So if you can, just go ahead and send a tweet, and or in the sidebar, there should be a question and answer bar. Uh, where you can ask questions, and uh, we will be able to respond to them. So if you're in Google Hangout, if you could go ahead and just write a question in the sidebar. Uh, if you happen to be watching through YouTube or just on our website, if you could shoot a tweet out with the hashtag PixarPostBC, which is seen right down here under our names. i got to get the <laughs> spacing. Uh, we will know that you can hear us and that the volume levels are okay we just want to test these things out before we get going and assume that uh, all is well. But certainly to the people that are here, welcome, and we appreciate uh, you tuning in and watching. It's really cool. So there we go. So I know there's a little bit of delay on this as well, so we'll expect to see some tweets here in uh, just a couple seconds. Yeah, this uh, is our first Google Hangout, so dun dun dun. This is a learning curve for us too. Right, so it's pretty exciting, and we're you know expecting some of these to, to grow as we go, and they'll have some hiccups along the way. Um, but certainly, uh, you know, we see that uh, Ryan Hirsch is in the chat room. He mentioned, he said, or in the question and answer, he said, uh, hi. So I'm actually going to select that one, currently answering it. I'm going to say done. Thank you for that, Ryan. Uh, and I also saw that you had had, uh, is anyone here? We're going to go ahead and just take care of that one. And Ah, uh, fantastic. We have another one that says, hi, I can hear you. Fantastic. Thank you very much. So, of course, we are here. We're going to be kicking off here in just a couple seconds. But, of course, we are here as the first rendition of the Pixar Post Book Club. And we are going to be discussing, of course, Creativity, Inc. Uh, I will show you my copy that I uh, got Luckily, was able to. There was a one of the signings that Ed Catmull did, uh, where he offered a opportunity to have a signing signed copy set. So it was pretty cool. We talked about that in our post. Uh, so if you happen to see that post uh, where we were talking about his speaking events, that was an opportunity to get that. But the copy that I read is here, and I always take off the dust jacket when I start reading. Um, there's also tons of notes and highlighting in there. Is full of yeah. I'll go. I'll go here. Here. Here's even just like an example here. You can see like I've written a whole bunch of garbage off in the side pages. I've got highlights everywhere. Uh, it was a fantastic book. Is a fantastic book. Um, I don't know how much of it we're going to be able to get through on today's discussion. We're going to try to get done with absolutely as much as we can. If for some reason we can't, we'll either continue it in the forum, which is where the main bulk of the Pixar Post book, book Club happens uh, throughout the time that we're reading. And uh, if we feel like it was uh, you know, really going along and people have a lot of questions and we're really getting a lot of feedback back and forth, then we will absolutely do a part two if we can't squeeze it all in here. We're going to try to hold this within an hour and a half, an uh, hour to an hour and a half, depending on how it goes, and we will commence from there. Um, trying to see what else. Uh, we will, at the end of the show, we will announce uh, what our next book that we're going to be reading is. If you've already read it in the forum, then you are in the know. But we do have the next book that we're going to be reading, and I know that a couple of our readers, as well as uh, Dan, the Pixar fan, who's listening right now, so hello, Dan, uh, he is and was reading this for a class he was in, so it's going to be pretty cool to see uh, how this goes. But uh, either way, let's see, do we have any other here? Well, before we get started, it looks like someone asked us what our favorite Pixar films are. It's kind of like a fun thing to get oh. started before we dive into Creativity, Inc. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so go ahead, what's yours, honey? Okay, well, I would say that uh, my, oh, th this, is, uh, this is Dan here. This is Dan here. He's trying to get sneaky with us. So um, this is almost an impossibility to, to really narrow it down, I think a lot of people go through this when they try to think of, you know, what is their favorite, but I'm going to say that it is Toy Story 2, uh, and that reasoning is, if you've listened to our podcast or read our site, you've heard us say before, 
that uh, that was Julie's and my first date movie in 1999. Yes. We're older than we look. <sighs> well, maybe... We're... Maybe we look old. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. So, whoo. So, anyways, yes, I would say that that is... Uh, my favorite Pixar movie, but what is uh, what is Julie going to say for hers? Is it going to be the same thing? No, it's actually not. Okay. Um, I have two because I just do. Um, Brave. If you listen to our podcast, I rave about Brave. Um, I love, 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 love it. And um, I also really, really love Masters University. I would have to say that's another one of my favorites. That's one of your favorites, huh? Yeah. Well, Wally too. It's just so hard. But if I had to choose one, it would be Brave. Okay, it's going to be Brave. She's going with Brave. So, yeah, anybody else in uh, either on Twitter or in the Google Hangout, if you want to throw in what yours is as well, i uh, love to hear it as well. I see that Ryan Hirsch wrote Monsters University. I don't know if he was just actually... He was just saying that about your shirt. Oh, he's saying that about the <laughs> shirt. I was just being hopeful that that was maybe what his already was. <laughs> so that's cool. Uh, Ryan is asking if Ed Catmull will be here. No, unfortunately, Ed will not. Uh, we didn't actually even go that far as putting out the request for Ed uh, to, to come along. And in fact, uh, in preparation for the book club, one of the things that we did as well is read a lot of other online book club information as well as uh, viewed some other live broadcasts that happened. And a lot of times they did have either the book's author, editor, or something like that that was present. And we actually chose to... Uh, not do that because we wanted to actually dig into, rather than asking questions of the author uh, or the editor, uh, Amy Wallace, uh, to, and co-writer, co uh, to, to talk through that. We thought it would be really good if we could get some uh, spirited discussion going back and forth on the, the chapters. Some of the Pixar elements that we drew out of uh, the book and things like that. So it was pretty interesting. So, uh, Catherine Anderson has said Wally is her favorite, uh, and that's obviously a good choice. One thing that I will say, uh, this is our Pixar Post lab, if you will. This is where we record the podcasts, if you happen to be a listener. Uh, chances are, if you are here, you're probably a, a podcast listener. Uh, up on the wall this way, <laughs> i got to get used to going backwards, up on the wall above... Uh, what's what's that guy's name again? Why am I forgetting that all of a sudden? The guy from Lifted. Uh, he, uh, I have a, a letter on the wall, a little note that Andrew Stanton wrote me. Uh, Julie was kind enough to write a letter in. Many, many moons ago. 2007 or 8. Ago. Uh, and it was something that I've framed and hung up, and it gives me a lot of inspiration. Over on this side, or this side now, we have a Partysaurus Rex poster that Mark Walsh gave us. We won't give too much of this away. And behind Julie, just to give a little tour if you want to duck for a second, Julie, is our replica of the Speedway of the South set that we've created. Uh, it's not uh, the official by any means, but uh, this is only a subset of our toy collection and some of our memorabilia. We'll introduce you to the headquarters. Uh, we've got our tin toy toy up there. and hand bank and all those fun things. All right, let's get started. Okay, well the one question that I wanted to also talk about, thanks Ryan Hirsch for saying nice toys in the background, uh, I also wanted to ask people uh, how is, uh, how did you read the book? How did you read Creativity Inc? Did you buy the physical copy? Uh, did you download it on Amazon? Did you get the iTunes version? Or did you listen to the audio book? Uh, or is there another version that uh, I'm not thinking of for some reason. I think that pretty much encompasses them. I think we we don't have the digital version, but we have the audio version. We do have the audio version as well. Which is how I listen to most of it. Having a three-month-old around the house, it's harder to read, but it's easy to listen. Right. So um, I listened to some, and then I also went back through and then wrote my notes in here, and then I also have pages and pages of notes that I wrote additionally as well. Um, just because there's so much that I took away from the book. Um, being in business myself, I also you know, took away some of the business elements, but there were so many Pixar facts, it was just absolutely uh, awesome. Um, so, uh, let's see, Ben Sicato is also on, so welcome Ben from Everything Pixar. Uh, he says his favorite movie is Up. 
So that's really cool to see. And then Dan also mentioned that uh, his wife, Britta, mentioned that it was Monsters, Inc. So that's pretty cool with uh, hearing some more of these uh, favorite movies out there. And then uh, P.L. Brown also in the chat room said The Incredibles or Up. Uh, I think you have to choose one. I think you have to choose one. I chose two. We'll let it go. Uh, And Catherine Anderson says she bought the book, so thank you for letting me know, and that it looks very much like mine. Uh, yeah, it was one of those ones that uh, it just you just keep delving in. The further you go, the more you get out of it. So, also, in addition to everybody telling us how they read the book or obtained it, I'd also like to know, just on a scale of 1 to 5, and I'll start with Julie, uh, if everybody can either comment again on Twitter or in the Google Hangout, what do you give it on a scale of 1 to 5, 5 being best to the book overall? Go. I'd give it a solid 4. A solid 4. A solid 4. Okay. Maybe 4 and a half. I really, I enjoyed the stories. Um, I know you and I have discussed one of the um, chapters in which Ed talks about um, the tables, how they change the table format. And for me... The conference room table? The conference room table. That's right in the, that's right in the introduction. Yes. Yeah, we talked about that in the podcast as well because it's just so cool. But anyways, go it's ahead. It's just such a small thing but made such a big difference. And it's those kind of stories that go throughout the book mm-hmm. that I really enjoyed. Okay. So I would say solid four, four and a half. Okay. Uh, I would also say that from my standpoint, I'm actually going to go out on a limb and I'm actually going to say a five out of five. And the reason I say that is strictly because, like I said, um, you can't see necessarily all the books on the library back there, but there's another bookshelf over here that's full as well, just like that. I have, And there's actually books underneath uh, where Julie is as well. I have read quite a few business books as well, so I thought that this was the best of both worlds for me. Mm-hmm. Um, being a creative person, able to pull out some of the... The, the huge standard business practices. No, the huge tips. Not a lot. A lot of this was standard, and I'll we'll get into some of this as well. But the one thing that I really loved was so much of what Ed talks about. A lot of times when you read a business book, there's all these open-ended kind of like uh, catchphrases. Uh, you know, and Ed talks about that in the book that these mantras that come out, like uh, you know, story is king, story is king. Even Pixar, you know, said that, but it really doesn't mean anything because, frankly, it's just a mantra. The, you have to focus all your efforts on the people. So I guess, I guess to, you know, other business books focus on so many mantras, and a lot of times when I'm reading them, I turn away from the book and say, this just feels too, this feels like too much of like a little like, hey, what's going on here? I'm recognizing that something feels like it's missing. Mm-hmm. And uh, Ed answered almost every time. Every time I felt like something was missing, he answered with the response that I would want to hear. So he answered all of my objections. I said, well, if you do this, then what this is going to happen. And he would come right back with another answer. So I thought it was great. So I give it five out of five. Uh, I also can't wait to start talking about some of the inside Pixar stuff that I personally have not known before. Well, let's talk about it. Okay. Uh, also, just from hearing from some of the other people, Ryan Hirsch mentioned he got his copy from the library. He's giving it four and a half so far. He's not completed with it yet. And like I mentioned, Catherine, uh, she mentioned that hers is pretty much like uh, mine looks. So, okay, um, the introduction, we talked about that this is, uh, you know, covering a lot of Pixar information. It's also going to be about a management book. So chapter one uh, is getting started. There's a lot in here as far as, and I'm going to kind of, and this is where I'll be looking for some of the people that are listening along's feedback as well. Uh, If you have any questions or comments that you want to throw in here, uh, even if it's a comment, just go ahead and throw it. If you're in the Google Hangout, throw that in the questions, and that way we can read them. Uh, But like a regular book club would, you would spend some time and dig through each of the chapters and kind of flip the pages and say, here's what I thought about this and that. So we're going to spend a little bit of time and, and do that as well. And one of the things that I guess just kicked off the book right off the bat is how Ed talks about how Pixar is, a lot of times people misunderstand it for being fancy for fancy's sake, but they're missing the unifying idea that the building isn't luxury, but a community. And I thought that was really cool because a lot of times with places like Google, uh, you know, they, they even had that 
the movie The Intern, wasn't it? Was it The Intern? Internship. Internship, something like that, with uh, Vince Vaughn, Owen Wilson. Uh, but there's all these, like, the kooky slides, and there's the bikes to ride around campus and things like that. But Pixar is a little bit more functional. And even all the way through the end of the book, it comes back around when they talk about Pixar University and how important it is that some people might think, well, why would they offer a belly dancing class or a character modeling class for people that have nothing to do with character modeling? But it's really about building that whole sense of community and getting everybody together. So one of the things, I'm just going to jump to like the back idea at the Pixar University thing, is they talk about that um, if you have a director sitting next to a technical lighting uh, technical lighting director, and you have a story person in there, if they were all sitting in a conference room at work, they would not talk the same way as they would if they were sitting in a conference room or in another room learning about uh, belly dancing, again, because that was the example that one of the examples that's given in the book. So they're going to talk differently. So if they're going to talk differently there, they're forming a little bit more of a personal relationship and a friendship, and mm -hmm. I thought that that's really a good thing. Um, and then also he goes and talks at other levels of it that, um, you know, they have the basketball court. They have a, a swimming, swimming pool, pool, things along those lines. And that just shows and solidifies that Pixar values uh, exercise and, and uh, a wellness in their daily lives as well. It's not just about sitting at your computer desk and chopping out the work. It's about a whole totality of the work and life balance. You don't just say it, you do it. Right. So, okay. Um, and then obviously the, the big undertone of the book uh, with the subtitle of Overcoming the Unseen Forces That Stand in the Way of True Inspiration, uh, a big thing is talking about that there are many problems that are hidden from view. Um, and a lot of times uncovering them makes them uncomfortable, but it's something that uh, if they basically face headstrong, they can overcome it. So I thought that that was uh, a, a, you know, a good overview of what they're going to be talking about in the book as well. Um, so I'll just give a quick second here. Any uh, tweets there as, nope, as I flip good. the page here? Okay, fantastic. So yeah, there will be moments where we're uh, you know, pondering and looking through and uh, coming through the different uh, processes. So uh, that's kind of the the introduction. Um, yeah, there's a lot of great things that he has here. Um, he does talk about... Uh, what were you going to say? Um, no, finish your thought first. Yeah, I was just going to say that one of the things that Ed talks about is that um, you know he made this goal for himself early on that he wanted to create the first animated computer animated film. Mm -hmm. And he thought it would take about 20 about 10 years. Yes. It took him much longer than that. Yes. Um but after he achieved that goal, and I thought this was really interesting because I personally would I mean I guess I guess I can't know unless I was really there. Um but he says that after he realized that he created Toy Story, it was done. What's next? Uh so I thought that was really interesting because he wasn't as inspired to continue on and go to create another movie. He considered leaving. Um, and I thought that was pretty powerful because, you know, it's just, you think you make Toy Story. Well, you think you reached your goal, then what? Then you have to find a new goal because he did it. it took him 20 years instead of 10. Right. So, you know, when you're reading this, you could almost hear that internal struggle within his mind. Right. I don't know. I guess I. I guess. I guess he saw the bigger picture here. And again, like I said, you don't really know unless you're in it. But the bigger picture could be that um, you know he wanted to try to solve that further mystery of he saw the total value of Pixar and this creative culture that created Toy Story. Now, how do we forward that and not lose the energy and excitement that's happened there? So he wanted to. Uh, I came to realizing that trying to solve this mystery would be my next challenge of basically not letting a company sink uh, like a lot of other companies do. My desire to protect Pixar from the forces that ruined so many businesses gave me renewed focus. And we did have a comment in here from Katherine Anderson. She says, backpedaling to the beginning of the book, uh, 
this it was super cool. Uh, it was a super cool book for me to read from the get go because I'm currently a student at the University of Utah, and I found out that Ed graduated from the University of Utah as well, which kind of blew my mind. So neat. It actually is something that we've talked about with other people as well and how much it meant to them. Yeah, and um, recently, I believe it was last year, when he gave the um, keynote speech. It's either 2013 or 2012, I can't remember, um, but we did a post and we actually posted his entire keynote speech. Um, it's basically where he says that he was two inches from being there being no Pixar at all. Um, so if you haven't found, if you haven't like watched that, definitely because it's really good. It's also it's inspiring, just like this book. Well, it's mentioned. He mentions it in the book as well um, at that two inches. Right. So it's a really good tie-in to both uh, the commencement speech that he did as well as uh, in, in the book where he mentions that same story of driving and you know he makes that turn and all of a sudden his family comes his around family. the corner his dad's driving their 57 whatever it was it's a station wagon of some sort and another car was swerving into their lane they couldn't turn out of the way or they would fall off the cliff because there was no guardrail so they had to try to you know they just hit him but he, he got out of the car and he observed that essentially if this oncoming car had hit them like in two inches of a different place it could have shoved them over the Right. The edge, which is just, I mean, it's crazy to think uh, because there is a whole thing. Um, there is a whole thing about, uh, you know, randomness and how as much as you want to try to predict things, it can't happen. I mean, you're, you're not going to be able to. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, so that's really, that's a really good uh, comment uh, as well about the University of Utah. I think a lot of people share that, that commonality, um, that kind of either going to Cal Arts. From right. John Lasseter's standpoint, and a lot of the other senior people, uh, with Brad Bird, trust. and yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a little bit of pride there, and then also going to the University of Utah holds a little bit of that pride from Ed Catmull's standpoint as well. It's pretty, pretty cool. Right. So, um, so let's get into it a little bit more here. On the uh, Ryan Hirsch has left a comment, but I'm actually going to hold off on that one because I do know where I think I want to bring that one up where it, where it jumps in. But it is a great point because that is a very interesting part about the baby, leaving the baby in the car, and that's uh, when we get to Toy Story 2. So one of the things that comes up early in the book, like you had mentioned, was the big table, mm -hmm. the big conference room table, how it created that hierarchy without intending to do so. So imagine you go into a conference room. You've got a big conference room table. We'll call this the conference room table. So everybody's sitting around the conference room table, and typically uh, the, what they were seeing is that the most important people sat near the middles on either side, and then it got less and less important as it went around the room. At least that's how it was perceived. Right. Not that these people were less important, really. They were just perceived that way among the group. And what that also meant is while if John Laster, Ed Catmull, Pete Doctor, let's just say, are sitting here, uh, the people on the, uh, on the outsides are not going to contribute as much either. So if they're not contributing as much, they're not getting the full value of having them All these people in the meeting. In the room. So I thought it was really interesting, the story that came about there. They just realized it organically one day that they needed to do a change. And so... Ed walks into their facilities department and essentially just says, hey, I need to change this uh, because it's, it's killing us. We, we're, we're creating this, architect, this hierarchy. But then what I thought was even more interesting, because obviously I mentioned that note that I have from Andrew Stanton. It always holds a special place in my heart. Uh, I love the part when he says, when Andrew Stanton, one of our directors, entered the meeting room that morning, he grabbed several place cards and began randomly moving them around, narrating as he went, we don't need these anymore. Uh, he said that uh, in a way that everyone in the room gasped. And that to set that up, it was because even though they got rid of the square table, they were still having people that were still sitting with assigned seats in right. groups. So now it's just basically a first come, first serve. So well, I think like with any office, I mean, when you would go into a meeting, I know at my work, where I used to work, I mean, every time you went to a meeting, I had a certain seat that I would always sit in. You know, and everyone did. Even when right. new people would come, you know, they would just kind of hold back and like everyone else would sit and then they would sit, you know, in right. the empty seats. So I think that's really interesting and I found that really valuable actually. Right. Right. 
Yeah, and I see that Catherine Anderson said, I certainly wouldn't, especially after the name tags popped up. <laughs> so same kind of thing. I mean, you know, once once those seats are kind of established, yeah, that's just kind of where it goes. Um, so Ed Catmull then goes through his journey of wanting to always be an animator. He goes through um, some of the, the great uh, stories of him growing up, and then ARPA, uh, which... I'll see if I can remember where I saw that ARPANET um, developed and funded by ARPA. I don't remember what it stood for off the top of my head at this point, but uh, ARPA was, he was lucky enough at the school he went to that there were at UCLA Santa Barbara, um, they had a mandate to support smart people in a variety of areas, uh, and I'm just reading it right out here, was carried out based on the unwavering presumption that research would try to do, uh, researchers would try to do the right thing in ARPA's view, overmanaged them was counterproductive. So I'm kind of jumping around here, and I'm going to try to focus this a little bit more in a second. But um, what he was saying early on here is that when he was in uh, his schools, he was being pushed into programs where they allowed this openness. Mm -hmm. And the ARPA mandate basically uh, was that you can't overmanage people. And that was one of his early lessons uh, that he took away from when he was in the college days, is that if he overmanages people, it's micromanaging. It ends up just demeaning people even more. You have to put the trust. Uh, you just have to trust that, uh, that they're going to do the right thing. Um, and... We have a comment here from Katherine Anderson. I love that the... the, 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 the. Yeah, and I'm, I am going to read this. It is a good comment. I love that the high ups at Pixar made a decision to be all-inclusive. You don't see or hear that many uh, happening often at huge companies like Pixar. Um, when, we, when you say all-inclusive, uh, made the decision to be all-inclusive... As far as uh, are you are you saying, Catherine, about uh, that uh, that they were inclusive as far as in the book and their overall comments throughout the book? What's your interpretation of that? I mean, all inclusive could. Yeah, give us a little bit more on that, Catherine. I like the idea, um, and it, you're you're absolutely right that at Pixar, at Pixar um, and maybe now that I'm thinking about it, uh, maybe you're talking about the fact that uh, that it's an open door policy. Uh, that you can pretty much walk into Ed Catmull's office at any time. So, but uh, either way here. So, uh, so anyways, Ed goes through his whole thing of where he got into the history of animating his hand for the first time. He has a fun little story about the fact that, um, you know, he, he plunged his hand into plaster to, to create the mold that he eventually used to create the, the digital grid. version of his hand, the grid on it. And when he he said he should have put some Vaseline or something on his hand because right. when he pulled it out, he pulled off all the little oh, hairs on his hand. <laughs> I mean, that's just craziness right there. So, um, anyways, the, the the story just keeps going on and on about his journey. I want to kind of skip forward to get to some of the Pixar uh, news. So, well, now I'm going to backtrack. One of the, the the things that Ed has done in the field of computing. Uh, it is just absolutely uh, amazing. So he obviously created uh, the idea behind what he's calling subdivision surfaces. So that is the basis for all things. Instead of having it be uh, you know, rectangles or anything like that, there are polygons and other triangle shapes that form the mesh uh, that put together. So if you get enough of them, you can really get a more realistic shape. Uh, he also created the Z-buffer. Um, the Z-buffer was designed to address the problem of what happens when one computer animated object is hidden or partially hidden behind another one. And I think that that's really interesting because I never thought of that as being an issue, but that intersect, I mean, we hear about it in a lot of the extras on DVDs, that mm -hmm. intersect uh, is a little bit of an issue, is an issue where things can kind of like, you know, go through each other. Um, it the Z-buffer assigns a depth to every object in a three-dimensional space, telling a computer to match each screen's pixel to whatever object is closer. And he says, today, there is a Z-buffer in every game and PC chip manufactured on Earth. He created that. It's incredible. And the fact that, 
the fact that he does have, since I already mentioned it, an open door policy at Pixar, and you can come in and talk to him, you know, essentially when he's there, and if he's not, you know, if he's not already talking to somebody else, uh, you can catch his ear if he's walking through. It's an amazing thing to know that somebody that large and high up in a company has that kind of an open door policy. Yeah. What's fascinating um, to us being animation fans is to know that that's someone who created this, who created this whole like process and it's just mind blowing when you think about it. It's almost you think of these people as being like what TJ and I call them as like untouchables, how you would never be able to get into their mind, let alone meet them. So reading this book is kind of like getting a glimpse into his incredible mind. Which is amazing. Yeah, it's like absolutely. reading a biography on Bono or something. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's it 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 is in some level he's an untouchable. So, but anyways, so again, we're gonna in the future books that we're gonna talk about, we're gonna also talk about some of the uh, the Pixar history as far as when it was born. So, you know, Ed talks about um, when he moved to New York Institute of Technology. Uh, and it was funded by a gentleman that wanted to f further computer sciences. Um, and so one of the first people that he hired along the way was Alvy Ray Smith, mm -hmm. who uh, you know is instrumental in Pixar's history. But a lot of the, the Pixar history stuff we're going to reserve for some of the other books as well because uh, we are going to be discussing a lot of those topics and areas Coming in up. them. Um, but one of the other things that Ed did in 1997, he wrote a 2D animation program called Tween, which performed what's known as automatic in-betweening, filling in frames of motion between key shots and otherwise expensive and labor-intensive process. So that's pretty amazing, too. Not only the Z-buffer that he was involved with, but now he's involved with the automatic in-betweening. So what that means is an animator creates, do you know what it is? Yes, no, you're going to have to, because the technical stuff, I, I mean, I get it, but when you, you've got to break it down almost. Okay. So an animator will create a keyframe of an animation at this point. So we've got, an, uh, we've got a character running from here to here. So you can create a keyframe of a character here, you create a keyframe of a character here, and then one final one here. Mm -hmm. You're creating three of those. The computer is animating all those frames in between. In between. So he created in, 1990, in 1977 a 2D animation program called Tween, which takes care of that. So that is also a basis for something that still exists at Pixar today as well. Really fascinating stuff. It really is. Um, and then the other thing that is set up very early on with the book is that uh, they realized that, computers, uh, that computer sciences were really in the infancy of you know, the world at this point. There wasn't many places that had done anything with it. And with him and Alvy Ray Smith, uh, they decided that no matter what work they were going to do, like this tween program and things like that, they were going to publish it for the outside world to discuss. And I thought that was really fascinating because a lot of times, like I guess if I think, you know, another company and person that kind of goes hand in hand with Pixar is Steve Jobs. And if Which I is, he's talked about a lot in the book. Absolutely. Not a lot, but, you know, yeah, quite, quite a bit. bit. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. So if you think about Steve Jobs, um, and then you have Steve Wozniak, who was the, the guy that really did a lot of the, well, I mean, he created a lot of the personal chips that were, you know, the, the, the motherboards hardware. and a lot of the hardware that was involved in that. And he was part of a homebrew computer club, and he wanted to give away all his ideas as well to further computers. And he thought, you know, nobody's ever going to buy this kind of stuff. Steve Jobs was the one that came along and said, you know, hey, we need to market this so mm -hmm. that way it can be something that we can make money off of. And he kept pushing uh, Steve Wozniak to do that. But Ed Catmull and Alvy Ray Smith held the, a similar viewpoint to Wozniak where they said, hey, we're at NYIT. We want to engage this community and grow it as fast and as much as possible. And they thought if they shared all of their knowledge with the world, it would essentially... Uh, create a larger knowledge base and make people want to go to NYIT, NYIT to work with them as well. So I thought that was really uh, interesting because Pixar still holds that today. You can go to Pixar's website and there's a Pixar research page where they talk through 
you know, all the different projects that they're working on. There's oh, the Pixar library. The Pixar library. There's technical documents. Um, it's real. It's actually really fascinating. I mean, we both explored there. Some of it is so technical, like it's really hard to understand. But when you really dive in and you really focus on it, it's amazing that they're sharing this information. Hold on. <laughs> Oh, because he's getting something that he's reading right now. <laughs> okay, so we can see this one. Here's another. Computing smooth surface contours and with accurate topology. So, I mean, there's uh, these are the type of uh, technical documents that Pixar is still giving out today and, and still discussing. And these are all free on Pixar's website. They talk about what they're doing to advance the field. They're ta they talk about it with, uh, with RenderMan as well. I'm just going to leave the headphones off, actually. Um, but they talk about it with RenderMan, which was just released as well, how it's uh, a standard uh, that they're releasing as an open source, so mm -hmm. that way more companies will continue to use it. As there, I mean, there are other ones out there, um, that the other renderers out there, but it's interesting to see that they still hold that same viewpoint today, that if Pixar wants to attract the smartest and... Brightest. Brightest people that they should still be doing what they did back in the day at NYIT. Well, yeah. NYIT. Um, so I thought that was really uh, interesting. So essentially along the way uh, comes George Lucas, and George Lucas wants to create a computer division. He's seeing the value in this because of the, obviously what he's done with Star Wars. Um, so he wants to expand it. He tells... He, he basically woos Ed Catmull over to Lucasfilm. Uh, it's based in Marin County. Mm -hmm. uh, and he and, and Ed Catmull ends up bringing along Alvy Ray Smith and several other people that he's done as well. But what I also thought was interesting that Ed learned early on is Lucasfilm being located in Mar Marin County. It says in the book here is one hour south of Silicon Valley by car and one hour from Hollywood by plane. Now... You've heard this a couple times as well. Pixar is not located in Hollywood on purpose as well. It's outside of it, so therefore it doesn't have as much influence on that local community, on L.A., and it doesn't. it's not in Disney's backyard and all these kind of things where other studios are. Right. They purposely wanted it to be away from it a little bit. And it's interesting that I wonder if... That Lucasfilm was the same way. Yeah, I wonder if Ed Catmull kind of took that as a little bit of inspiration. Oh, maybe. You know, to, to keep it a little bit further away. I don't I don't know. Well, that would be, actually, that would be a great question, like an inside question. Yeah, so I thought that was interesting a little bit. Um, and then the name Pixar comes up in the book as well. Um, and we had done a, a Friday fun fact not too long ago, if anybody follows that we do those every Friday now. Um, where did Pixar come from? So the name emerged from a back and forth between Alvy, Alvy Ray Smith and another colleague, Lauren Carpenter. Mm -hmm. um, and Alvy lobbied for Pixar, uh, which he imagined to be a fake Spanish verb meaning to make pictures. And Lauren countered with radar, which he thought sounded more high tech. That's when it hit him, Pixar plus radar equals Pixar. Pixar. Pixar, Pixar plus radar equals Pixar. So I thought that was really kind of like a you know neat little anecdote in the book there as well. That's been out there, obviously, in other books as well. But um, Always good to rehear it and rehash all that stuff. Yeah, yeah. So let's see. We've got some uh, rendering. Uh, the other strong point comes around, uh, uh, around the days of when Ed was at Lucas, he was asked to go visit Disney. Um, or when he was, I'm sorry, when he was at Lucasfilm, people were coming in and visiting all the time, a lot of A-listers, and this is where uh, the, a group of Disney animators came for a tour, and this is where he first meets John Lasseter. So Valentine's Day, 1983, so again, many moons ago. Uh, at, 31 to be exact. Oh, hey, look at that. Uh, no, 33. <laughs> I'm sorry, 33. Bad math over here. I had to go... One year more than I, how old I am. Yeah, yeah. So <laughs> Valentine's Day, 83, he says, As I showed them around, I noticed uh, that one of them, a kid in baggy jeans named John, seemed particularly excited about what we were up to. In fact, the first thing I noticed was his curiosity. 
So I thought it was really interesting um, that they're showing these Disney animators around, and Ed immediately kind of gets the the vibe that maybe this guy needs to... Yeah, that he stuck out to him. He stuck out to him. Um, So I thought that was interesting. So then they start to essentially learn that uh, if Ed is ever going to achieve his goal of making this computer animated film that he wants to, he's got all these technical guys. I mean, Alvy Ray Smith, Lauren Carpenter. He's got the technical guys, but he doesn't have somebody that knows how to do story. Right. So this is where he starts to see the value in John Lasseter. And you might... Um, I talked about this with uh, Dan, the Pixar fan, Dan Taylor, who's listening as well. Um, he And it says in the book, uh, it bowled John, John over. He wanted to know about more about this rendering program that they were doing. Uh, he had an idea. He told me he had a, for a film called The Brave Little Toaster about a toaster, a blanket, a lamp, a radio, and a vacuum cleaner whose journey to their city, to the city, to find their master, who journey to their city after finding their ma- after oh boy, to find their master after being abandoned in the cabin in the woods. So essentially, the master takes their kids, uh, takes the the objects to a cabin, leaves them in the cabin, and now it's their journey back to their master. So this is kind of uh, what I talked about with Dan is he asked me, and I hadn't thought about it before, about the similarities between that and Toy Story. That, you know, in Toy Story 2, they're essentially taken away, uh, Woody's taken away, right. and he has to get back. back. Uh, and then also with Toy Story 3, they go to the dump, which is, you know, kind of the same thing. Um, so I thought it was interesting. Mm-hmm. And so John wanted that an- to be the first animated feature where he was going to put hand-drawn characters on computerized backgrounds. Um, so that was really interesting that he, you know, they both had those kind of foresights there. Um, so John, yeah, essentially, so John is fired by Disney. He gets brought on to Pixar. Um, oh, there's an there's an option here. Um, something that I wrote a note on. He's written a lot of notes. <laughs> yeah, this is where. This is where we definitely need uh, some people to join us on the conversation as well. So it's not just me spouting this off. So certainly in the future, uh, we really do encourage people to to jump on and uh, join us in the yes. discussion as well. We do want to hear other people's thoughts. So video that way, chat with us. Yeah, video chat with us. So that way we can get these things across. Because I don't want it to be just a, a one-sided, I'm kind of talking about what I really liked from the book. So if anybody even listening now uh, is interested, send us a message. Julie will take care of uh, initiating you and getting you into the, the chat room. But uh, either way, um, there's a mention here of Wallace Shawn, and I thought it was interesting because here's a Pixar fact that I didn't know. Oh. Maybe, I, maybe you knew. Um, but John actually named uh, Wally in uh, The Adventures of... Andre and Wally B after Wallace Shawn, who eventually voices Rex. Right. So I thought that was really interesting. Did you already know that? No, I did not. I okay. mean, I remember listening to it on the audiobook. Um, right. This, but uh, that is actually really interesting because obviously Rex is one of my favorite characters. But um, mm. that is interesting that he did name one of the first shorts after him. Right. Yeah, I thought it was a cool little fun fact because I didn't know that one. Um. I, yeah, I didn't know that. I, just, I thought it was really interesting. Mm-hmm. And so, oh, and then this is where, um, at this point, when they do Andre and Wally B, they talk about the fact that they're kind of uh, just devastated with the fact that when they go to Sigraph and they're presenting this, it's not oh. a finished product. And when they're not, when they're presenting this, they realize that the crowd still erupted after it was done. Like went and, nuts. Yeah, and they were. It went from animation to wireframes back to animation because it wasn't done. Right. But uh, it was interesting that uh, this is where Ed basically says that because John made the su- suggestion to not just animate one character, he made the suggestion to incorporate the B as well. Right, two of them. Uh, or, yeah, Andre and Wally B, the two characters together. This is where Ed realized that it's not all about the technical elements, this is where he came up with kind of the basis for Story is King. So I thought that part was really interesting there. Mm-hmm. Um, Pixar almost sold 
um, you know, throughout this whole process. Uh, well, actually, I'm jumping ahead here. So George is uh, Lucas is actually going to be getting divorced. Uh, in part of the settlement, it's devastating his financial status. He needs to sell off some different divisions. George is saying, you know, hey, I don't think that, you know, this division is going to go where I need it to go right now. I need to, to kind of get rid of that. So they're, he's trying to sell it off for a long time, and they're trying to sell it off for somewhere at $15 million. Uh, the deal goes around and around, and the research, uh, there's many people that are looking to buy this. General Motors, Philips, uh, I mean, it, it's crazy. You know, that the fact that to think that Pixar could have not existed if the deal went through at General Motors or Phillips. General Motors. Yeah, <laughs> I know. Designing cars. We live in Detroit, I mean. Right, designing cars, but obviously they, they liked the ability of the fact that, you know, they were doing all this stuff with computer and, you know, that, that, that's when CAD's coming around and thing along, things along those lines. And Phillips is looking at it from an MRI perspective. They're saying we can do these amazing digital scans and all these kind of things. So they're within a week of doing these deals to get with General Motors and it falls apart. So he's, you know, basically, whew, because that could have been the end of Pixar. Right. We've, got, we've got the accident that... Two inches. Cat, well, two inches almost happened. Now we've got the selling off. Um, and so essentially after a lot of conversations, uh, Steve Jobs comes in. Swoops in. And he finally, you know, after after actually he made an initial, initial deal, it didn't go through. And then so he comes back around and he says finally after some time that, because uh, now Steve Jobs is kicked out of Apple. He started his next company, not the next company that gets NEXT. Mm-hmm. Um and now he wants to buy it, and it was uh, for five million, and then another five million of cash infusion. So ten million, really, essentially, is the total investment to to buy Pixar, which later on in life ends up getting sold for seven point six billion. That's quite the turnaround. Quite, eh? the, <laughs> quite the investment. <laughs> yeah. Um. So, of course, Steve Jobs being the computer wizard that he is, he doesn't see this as, you know, he's going to make a computer animated film. Uh, he ta- he says, we're going to make a, a computer. We're going to sell this computer you guys are using to process this data that, you know, people were interested sell the in. Sell the hardware. Right, they sell were going to sell the hardware. Sell the you, software. Which is what, you know, he was used to doing. So I thought that was really interesting. And then obviously... Um, we know that it happens. He takes over. Um, I'll sk- well, okay. So one of the, the a story that was really interesting too is that um, so the acquisition process uh, when he, they ended up buying it from Pixar from or from Lucasfilm, um, the CFO of Lucasfilm said that he had a way to establish his authority in the room, and this is where the mastery of Steve Jobs come in comes in, and he says it precisely because the CFO says you you arrive as late as possible. That establishes you're the most important in the room. Did I just say that? No, but you were getting there. Getting there. Okay. So he, that establishes that you're the most important person in the room. And so Steve Jobs basically says at precisely 10 a.m. Steve looked around and finding the CFO missing, starting the meeting without him. In one swift note, uh, move. Steve had not only foiled the CSO CFO's attempt to place him atop the pecking order but he grabbed control of the meeting at the same time. And that was something that I thought was really interesting because, you know, from a management perspective, there are those managers that I've even experienced that say, you know, like... Same here. You got you, you come into the meeting, you know, late. You just start... You, people are waiting for you. It establishes that they're waiting for you. But if the meeting started at 10... Steve just took it and ran with it, and he grabbed control of it and ended up, you know, essentially purchasing it at that point. Um, so, yeah, Steve got five million, five million. So, and this is, and once we get to chapter three at this point, this is uh, the defi- <clears throat> a defining goal. Uh, this is where you start to get to where Ed is talking through his. Uh, management beliefs. This is where you get into a little bit less of the history. This is where you start getting to the management beliefs and uh, you know some of the pricing um, 
Oh, pricing. Uh, uh, <laughs> kind of some of the background here. So, okay, I'll just jump right in here. So, uh, so now he's Pixar, Ed Catmull's Pixar's president. Uh, he has to hire and find good people. I think we've all been in these positions where we've kind of been plunked in a scenario where you don't necessarily feel fully confident um, and you're just thrust into this role where you have to do it. Obviously, he was managing the NYIT group, mm-hmm. um, but that still didn't lead him to, and, and Lucasfilm, he had his divisions at Lucasfilm, but that didn't lead him to feel like he was a manager. Um, it's almost like he had to find his own way. Right. So, and then now they're, they're playing the balancing game of going back and forth between... Um, between selling the hardware and creating shorts and commercials and all these other ways to try to find and make revenue because Steve was plowing millions and millions of dollars into the company as it wasn't uh, continuing, to, continuing to evolve. Um, and this is where you know Ed is looking back on his process and saying... Um, you know, I, I don't uh, I don't want us to fall into the same pitfalls that a lot of other companies uh, fall into. So, uh, where am I trying to pick up here? Because this is where it starts to get interesting with Disney getting involved. Well, with Katzenberg. Yes. Steve is known as intensive as core. Yeah, um, and Catherine Anderson online has mentioned this as well. She said, I love the story about Steve Jobs taking over meetings um, when Lucas sold Pixar. I think we kind of we talked about that one, but another one kind of just about Steve and his craziness, if you will. Nuances. Is, yeah, nuances, is that uh, you know, Steve was getting frustrated with the fact that they weren't making money. He says at one point in a, in a fit of essentially peak or rage, uh, he called me to say that he refused to make payroll. Uh, and Ed says, in my entire career, this may have been the only time I've ever slammed my door in frustration. Uh, even if Pixar doubled in value, Steve told me, we still wouldn't be worth anything. I felt increasingly burned out. I even thought about resigning. So that's another one of those stories that uh, we've heard before where Steve Jobs is essentially so grinding at times that he can really wear people down. Um, but it is, you know, I mean, Ed saw the full vision. He was in it for the long haul. Uh, he was not interested in... It's all of them working together, really, that made this, like, possible. Yeah. Um, okay, we've got another one here. Chapter 3, quote, where... Uh, this is, again, Catherine Anderson. She says, Chapter 3, quote, page 47. Uh, While they were generous with their advice, the most valuable lessons I learned were gleaning from the flaws in that advice. Um, I want to see the context here. Were there generous from the advice? The most valuable lesson I learned were gleaning from the flaws in that advice. Am I not seeing this? <laughs> Page 47. I'm on it. Oh. <laughs> Dun, dun, dun. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> well, we'll have to just move on from that one for now. But um, yeah, so so uh, at this point, they had had some success with the commercials that they were doing. Uh, Jeffrey Katzenberg, um, it says, sat at the end of a long dark wood conference table in the Team Disney building in the studio's lot in Burbank. Um, it's clear that the t- and the head of Disney's motion picture division was in a wooing mode, at least up to that point. It's clear that the talent here is John Lasseter. He said to John, Steve, and I, and we sat there trying not to look offended. Uh, and John, since you won't come work with me, I'll have to make it my work this way. Katzenberg wanted Pixar to make a feature film, and he wanted Disney to own and distribute it. Um, I remember this part. This part of them talked about... Right. Been like Pixar fan base for quite some time. Right. So yeah. So it's essentially, um, 
1991, we struck a three-picture deal under which Disney would provide the majority financing for Pixar movies, which Disney would distribute and own. Um, so they didn't really know how to make a movie at this point. They were pretty stuck, and they said luckily John had an idea mm -hmm. uh, that they could start working off of, but they still didn't know what to do. So the idea was obviously Toy Story, a group of toys and a boy, Andy, who loves them. Uh, the twist is that it would be told from the, the toys' point of view. Um, so John pitches the idea to Disney. Uh, after much revising, we get the green, right, green, green light. light for the script in January 93. Um, this is the part where it gets all crazy, where they want to change the character of Woody. Is that where you're going with this? Right. Um, and it, it was Katzenberg who said, you know, make him more edgy, correct? Yeah. Um, so they would essentially they were going back and forth. They were they would fly down to uh, the Disney headquarters. Um, Jeff, Jeffrey, yeah, Kassenberg uh, pushed them relentlessly to add more edge. Woody was too perky, too earnest. He thought um, he had. So they they go back. They make these changes to Woody. He had in short become a jerk. On November 19th, 1993, we went to Disney to unveil a new, edgier Woody in a series of story reels, a mock-up of the film like a comic book version with temporary voices. Uh, and that day will forever be known as Black Friday because Disney completely uh, and reasonably, the reaction to it was to shut it down until an acceptable script was written. So even though Katzenberg said, I want Woody to be more of a jerk, it essentially led to the project being shut down. Mm -hmm. Um one of many reasons that a lot of people don't necessarily have, you know, heartfelt feelings <laughs> to, for for Katzenberg. Um, just a different way of doing things. Not that they're wrong, it's just different. It didn't fit into Pixar's model, I would say. Right. I'd just say he's different viewpoint on things. Not that that's wrong, not that that's bad, it's just different. Right. So somewhere along the line, as they're making this movie, they realize that they're onto something. Steve Jobs mentions, you know, hey, we're we're going to take Pixar public, uh, and it's going to be a week before the movie comes out. Uh, Ed Catmull basically, and Ed, and John Lasseter said that they were like, what what are we talking about? Mm -hmm. How are we going to bring this uh, to be public if we're not even, you know, how do we know this is even going to be worth anything? Um, but Steve Jobs saw the full vision of it and believed in what. John Lasseter, Ed Catmull, and the team were doing, and he said, listen, if this movie makes it, if this movie hits it big time, uh, Disney is going to realize that they've created their own worst enemy, that we're going to make a ton of money for them, we only have a three-picture deal right now, and um, they're going to want to negotiate, renegotiate the contract right away. So this is where uh, you know, Ed got a little bit of that foreshadowing of business as far as that, you know, look a little bit further ahead, plan some moves. Mm -hmm. um, but that's kind of the genius of, of Steve Jobs in there uh, that he did. So, of course, um, the, you know, it goes public. Uh, they raised uh, $140 million for the company, the biggest IPO of 1995. Uh, so really just, like, puts... I mean, it comes... It, it goes a week after the after Toy Story comes out, totally blows everybody away in their expectations. Um, and then sure enough, of course, the, um, you know, the, uh, Katzenberg, not Katzenberg, uh, who's the Disney exec at this time, uh, calls. Eisner? Why am I not remembering this? But either way, yes, so the Disney executives call, and they say, sure enough, that, yeah, they want to renegotiate another... Uh, Pixar deal. I mean, another another deal here, so that way they can make more films. And of course, at this point, the only thing that um, the only thing that they are thinking is that oh boy, I just totally lost my train of thought. Where was I going with that one? I don't know where you were going with that one. <laughs> oh, but I man. do kind of want to. I was just looking at the time. It's already been an hour, so I kind of want to. Oh yeah, we do um, to skip ahead because we're still in the beginning of the book, and I think that maybe we should point out some of like the really things that. Like, um, I guess the moments in this book that really hit home to us 
um, rather than go through each chapter um, right now. And yeah. if more people want us to do that later, well, we definitely can. Um, but I want to talk about um, the dailies. I know this is kind of in the last part of the book. It's towards the end, um, but it's from one of my favorite directors, which would be Mark Andrews. Yes. Um, and his spunky personality, which <laughs> come on, I like adore. I just think that's awesome. Um, I think you need that, especially you know when you are kind of you know he was the director, and when you are that um, person that you know people are looking up to. Um, that you need to have that driving force. Um, but explain the um, dailies, how Ed Catmull discussed that in the, in the chapter. I can't remember what chapter it was. Uh, it's further in. Um, Ten. Yeah, it's lessons that they that they learn. He's essentially talking about the fact that, um, yeah, it is broadening our view, so that would be chapter nine, I believe. Um, but yeah, the dailies, he just talks about the importance of that everybody comes together that they're open and honest with each other every day, that Mark Andrews is there. They're, they're using him as the example. And, uh, yeah, Mark Andrews says specifically, uh, dailies are master classes in how to see and think more expansively, and their impact can be felt throughout the building. Some people show their uh, scenes to get critiques from others. Others come to watch and see what kind of notes are being given to learn from their peers and from me, my style, what I like and dislike. Mm -hmm. So I thought that was, it is really cool that, um, you know, it sounds like the opportunity is not just for the people that, uh, you know, are working on the project necessarily, but other people can step in and get these notes. Right, and get some input. And this is where I found it interesting with, you know, stepping, you know, putting Pixar aside when you read something like that, and you can really utilize that towards, you know, business, like, a no not that Pixar is not a normal business, but a standard day-to-day -day business. Again, not that Pixar is not, but just a different business that, you know, you have, you know, someone like an Ed Catmull in your office, mm -hmm. and, you know, you want that feedback, but maybe that's not the person who you would normally go get that feedback from. It's interesting to see that Ed, you know, sets time aside, and he'll give that feedback to that person. Sure. And that's something that you can utilize, you know, or that other professionals can utilize in their business world. Yeah. Absolutely. Which I really enjoyed that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, you know, kind of just as I'm able to uh, have a little bit of time to look through as well while you were mentioning that, it's um, you know going back to, to Toy Story one. You know, after they had the success there, they are working on Bugs Life. You've got the main team working on Bugs Life. They create this secondary crew that's working on uh, Toy Story two, which Toy Story two they wanted to. Um, be a direct-to-video release originally is what Disney said, um, but they said they they agreed. To, Pixar agrees to it originally. Uh, they come back and they basically say that no, we're not going to do that um, because it's actually putting in the mindset of people that there's an A team and a B team. And I thought right. it was really strong that Ed Catmull came back and said we may have agreed to this that we were that we were going to do it, but we can't because we don't know how to do subpar uh, story. Um, so they set off this team uh, a year into the production. This is where then you know, that fame story of where John comes in and has to rescue the project. There's like nine months to get it done. Um, There's so many interesting things that happen with the making of Toy Story 2. I mean, the film was, you know, almost deleted forever. I mean... You know, thank goodness there was, uh, you know, was it one of the animators? Yeah, it was Tia Cratter, uh, who she had, oh wait, it wasn't Tia no, Cratter, wasn't Galen Tia Sussman. Cratter. Yeah. Galen Sussman, one of the producers, I believe? Not a producer, production. Yeah, she was on maternity leave and she right. was working from home, so she had the actual whole film at her house, um, and that's how the film was basically saved. So I thought that was really interesting. So to hear more about Toy Story 2, and obviously our connection with Toy Story 2 being our first date. Right. Right. So, um, yeah, there's a couple things from that that I've actually always wondered, uh, which was with the copy that was on Galen Sussman's computer, the first thing I think of is, are there any concerns about... Uh, because Ed Catmull brings that up as far as being flexible. Mm -hmm. If they weren't flexible in allowing their employees to make decisions without having to worry about... Um, 
about the, the, the ramifications of their actions, then uh, they, would, they wouldn't have had that saved. So she was out on maternity leave. She is working on this project, but I just think, like, is there any security concern here? Yeah, I'm, I'm sure there is more now. I mean, that's, you know... Right, that, yeah, it was... Mid-90s, 90, so... 99, yeah, yeah well, when it like, came out, it was 99. Yeah, right. mid to yeah. late 90s, but... um, So maybe not so much, but now definitely. And it is interesting because I do feel like Pixar still has, um, you know, treats their employees like family. Like everyone's a family member. And I think that, you know, speaking back to like the other businesses that are reading this as a business book, you know, to really look at that and to really, you know, treat your employees as if they were family because I do think that a lot of um, businesses fall short. So, you know, this is just one of many stories that, you know, can help, you know, that management set help their employees feel, you know, important or work around something. Like, you know, you have someone who's, you know, high up and, you know, they just had a baby, but she still wants to work, but she still wants to be home with her baby, you know, so she's willing to, you know, help out, but do things at home. So I think that a lot of people can really learn from stories like that within this book. Yeah, it, uh, you know, the other thing that I thought about from this, too, and I had a note of this, is the, the deletion of it, to take one step back, was uh, actually... Uh, and by the way, uh, Galen Sussman was a movie supervising technical director. Um, it was on, uh, the, the Toy Story 2 was on Unix systems, and there's a command that allows you to remove everything on the computer, period. What I want to know is he talks about on here that uh, after the loss of the film, our priorities were in order, restore the film, uh, fix our backup systems, because their backup system also failed, and then install precautionary restrictions to make it more difficult to access the deletion command directly. Notably, one item that was not on our list is find the person responsible who typed the wrong command and punish him or her. Mm -hmm. So I thought it was really interesting, though, because I want to know. I mean, I know that, you know, obviously there's no way to know. But it, the first thing that comes to my mind is, who did it? And was it, I mean, why? Was it obviously an accident? Uh, yeah, um, but I mean, it's just it's another it's another crazy command. It's you know forward but, slash bin rm r you know all these are crazy things. Yeah, but I mean another you know what he mentioned is there it wasn't find the person who did it. You know. That's what I mean, but I still want to know who did it. Because oh. <laughs> so, somebody there, I mean, is it, they they hopefully hopefully he knows and he's just protecting them. But I hope somebody isn't living with this deep dark secret. Because seriously, if I did that. Oh, it would be awful. I wouldn't be able to live with it. Would you? It was just, it was, you know, but it worked out. So it was just an accident that, right. thank goodness, everything worked out. Right. Yeah, and uh, Catherine Anderson says she, uh, also back to our earlier comment that uh, when we mentioned that it was going to be on uh, a, a direct to, Toy Story 2 was going to be direct to video, uh, she said that it was great that it was not moved to direct to video either. So when um, John Lasseter uh, finally takes a look at this, um, Andrew Stanton is sent out to Disney to present this version that they've been working on, the disastrous version that the existing Toy Story team has been working on. And after he screens it, he says, we know the film needs major changes and we're in the process of mapping them out. So they're trying to say, you know, hey, he, he, let's, we've got this, we've got, a, we've got a plan, we're going to do it, we're still going to get there, to his surprise, Andrew Stanton says, the, the, the Disney executives disagreed. The movie was good enough, and besides, there wasn't time to do an overhaul. It's only a sequel. Politely but firmly, Andrew demurred, we're going to redo it. So I think it's really awesome that it... it I mean, throughout the book, we already know that, and even outside of the book, we know that Pixar stands for quality inside and out. Mm -hmm. um, but it's really cool that no matter what, they kind of they hunkered down and they said, no matter what, we're going to do this and we're going to do it right because we don't want our company to become this, you know, less than... I mean, they, they had Bugs Life, they had Toy Story at this point. They don't want Toy Story 2 to blow up in their face and, you know, be something that... Where they've got they this... set the bar high for themselves. Absolutely. So John Lasseter says, January 2nd, everybody get some rest over the holidays, January 2nd, we're, we're reboarding the entire thing. Um, and this is actually um, something that we're going to talk about right after this as well, something I didn't know, uh, the, the first thing I didn't know from reading the book. 
Um, but this part is, it says, Ed Catmull, this is the first time that I had to tell a director that we were replacing them, and it was anything but easy. Um, I thought that was interesting, just like, you know, that this is the this is the first film that it was done on, but since, it's been done on quite a few. And, you know, other people in the industry and Ed Catmull have said that he feels that maybe it would be beneficial to be done more often, um, just because getting those different viewpoints, and he talks about elsewhere in the book, Ed Catmull does, that, you can get so uh, deep into the story that you lose sight of the overall picture. Mm -hmm. And so sometimes, I mean, that's why obviously they have a co-director, but sometimes it could be a really good thing to still have some yeah. in there as well. Right. So um, anyways, to get to the, to the other thing here, so the, with Toy Story 2, just to wrap this up, uh, they basically went into a, a room, they locked themselves in, the five brain trust at that time, is this is when the terminology brain trust came around, was John Lasser, Andrew Stanton, Pete Doctor, Joe Ranft, and uh, Lee Unkrich. Um, so it says, yeah, the next nine months would be the most grueling production schedule we would ever undertake, the crucible in which Pixar's true identity was forged. And this is where a comment comes up that uh, Ryan Hirsch had mentioned that there's a part in the book where they talk about a baby in the car. And there is... <clears throat> the, the Basically, the staff was so overworked. Uh, Ed says that a full third of the staff had a repetitive stress injury of some point. So they had, like, carpal tunnel, or, you know, they're just from, you know, going like this, they had something in their shoulder. Or, just I mean, constantly just, working. Just absolutely blowing my mind how they, they they slept there. They were just working for nine months straight. How do you make a movie in nine months? A, a film that's usually created, I mean, from research and development, what, six to eight years? Eh, five. Five is average. So, I mean, it's just interesting, though, that, uh, I yeah. I think Brave was eight. Well, Brave was, an, Brave was an anomaly. It was a longer process. <laughs> um, so one morning in June, an overtired artist drove to work with his infant child strapped into the back seat, intending to deliver the baby to, the baby to daycare along the way. Um, sometime later, after he'd been at hours of work for a few hours, his wife, also a Pixar employee, happened to ask him how the drop-off had gone, which is when he realized that he had left the child in the car uh, in the broiling Pixar parking lot. They rushed out to find the baby unconscious and poured cold water over him immediately. Thankfully, the child was okay. But Ed took it as this is the first time that he's realized that this type of production schedule cannot, cannot happen. happen. And that part is really interesting and really thought-provoking because along the way, you know, Ed's writing this book as an expert, um, you, you take it as that. But he's really telling you these stories as a way to say, no matter what's going to happen, you're going to run into issues. You're going to be confounded. You're not going to know what to do. But hopefully you can glean something from what we've messed up on and what we're going to continue to mess up on. Because he says right. they're still going to continue oh. it. Uh, You'll never be perfect at anything. Right. But it's uh, interesting to see you know, just how that evolution happened there and what happened to that employee and, whew, just... Uh, it was a pretty deep, you know, story, but also, you know, realistic that kind of made you really realize when you heard that story that, you know, how hard all of those people were working. And, I mean, you know, stepping back from Pixar, I mean, you know, living, you know, where the automotive, the big three are. I mean, how many times... You know, do people we know work, you know, 16-hour days, mm -hmm. you know. At, oh, absolutely. You know, the car plants and everything like that. And you're just working yourself to the bone. You're running yourself ragged. Um, I mean, on top of, you know, films are now produced here and made here. And, you know, those are 16 to 20-hour days. These people just run themselves ragged. So hearing a story like that from a studio that, you know, you and I have affinity for mm -hmm. was really interesting. Yeah, without a doubt. Um, I'm going to hop around a little bit because the other thing that uh, was mentioned was the director change. Oh. And there's a couple others that I wanted to talk about. I'm going to kind of group the, the discussion of uh, director changes here because one of them that was really interesting for me, and I did not know this uh, at all, was that, and they mentioned it twice, in fact he mentions it twice, about... Uh, 
about having to change directors for Monsters University. Now, I hadn't known that. I'd heard rumors of it. Right. Uh, I'd be interested to see if anybody else had heard anything uh, as well, uh, but I had only heard rumors of that. I had never heard a confirmation that that was the case. Mm -hmm. And it had to have been early on, uh, because from a timing standpoint, and I talked about this with, with Dan separately as well, the timing of it, um, Dan Scanlon, the director that we know of on Monsters University, was at D23 in 2011. Yeah, 11. So obviously that director change has happened pretty early because if we're talking about 2011, it came out in 2013. 13. That's two years there. Three years before that approximately is when they probably would have started on that. It's interesting to me that I've never we've never heard any rumblings of it. It wasn't in the Art of book. It wasn't like a Brave where we saw Brenda Chapman, you know, and it was public, it was discussed mm -hmm. that Mark Andrews was going to be coming in and taking that over. So I thought that was really interesting. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I'd be interested to see if uh, anybody else had uh, had heard that one as well, or any other musings about that. The other thing that I talked, that I, that I read that kind of intrigued me from a manager standpoint as well was about Newt. Uh, he talked about the story of um, how the, how the story was not working, it wasn't uh, progressing the way that they wanted, and so they decided that they were going to have to just shut the whole project down. They had done that in kind of a vacuum. They had actually taken the staff and they said, we're going to take uh, inexperienced people, give them an experienced leader, and let them run with this project, and they're going to have their offices outside of Pixar's offices so we can't even influence them. They said they want to do this as kind of an experiment. And this is more information that I wasn't necessarily aware of. Um, and that was, uh, was that, that, why am I blanking? You lost the, your thought. On, no, on the director. Who was directing that one? On Newt. Oh, goodness gracious. We'll get back to you. Okay, yeah. So anyways, they said, Ed Catmull said that they, when they got to the decision of shutting that project down, they said that they, he said that the, the story was moving along and they were believing in it, but that they didn't feel right taking the story away from them. Mm -hmm. That it was their, his story and his story only, and it couldn't be given to someone else. But what I thought was interesting about that comment is that's exactly what happened on Brave. Uh, you know, because people associate the main story of Brave with Brenda Chapman. Because you know she's credited with writing the main basis, you know the, the the through point of Merida being feisty and you know with her daughter, with her daughter and everything like that. So I wonder with with that was that what were the differences there? I mean this is where it just gets philosophical. It's not in the book, but what were the differences there, and how was that? Uh, Actually, I do kind of think that you know this was in the book, but not in the book. <laughs> um, it's, you know, kind of like when you said that, the, you know, sometimes the director's, you know, too close to the project. You just have to, you know, I don't remember exactly how he worded it in the chat, one of the chapters, but, yeah. um, you know, that you kind of have to step away. And, you know, I think with Brave, you know, you kind of have to step away if something's not working right. It's for the better of the film. That's what I think. Yeah, I just, I just thought it was interesting, though, that they said, like, the story, that that story element was there, though. But they said they had to, they didn't want to shut it down fully. Um, and Newt was Gary Rydstrom. Thank you. Thanks, Dan. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know why I was forgetting that one off the top of my head there. But, uh, yeah, that was uh, interesting for me. Um, so I know we're getting close to our time at this point. We do want to keep this pretty close. So let's talk about some of the other facts that we learned in here. Yeah, let's just, you know, kind of toss like a couple things, you know, another five, ten minutes or so. Yeah, and I do um, appreciate everybody sticking in. I know we've had some people come and go throughout this. Uh, I do appreciate people sticking in. Uh, you know, obviously this is the first time we've run this, and we do have uh, actually some really good insights that uh, we'll have uh, better in place for either continuing this discussion if we decide to do that or on the next book club and we'll definitely make sure that uh, the people... And the next Google Hangout because I think we're going to do another couple Google Hangouts that aren't um, I guess geared towards books maybe just discussions. Yeah, we're just going to do fun random, discussions with you know, as well. With Pixar fans, so... 
yeah, we, we do have some other things coming up there as well. But, yeah, we do have some good ideas for here, so definitely thanks for sticking in. We really appreciate it. But uh, Inside Out, let's talk a little bit about that. So a couple things that we learned here. Um, within the book. Within the book. Let me get to it here. Um, He's checking his notes. Yeah. Why don't you, um, as far as on, uh, oh, uh, Catherine Anderson brought up a good point, too, about on Chapter 12, uh, going into Disney, and, uh, you know, this is when uh, Ed Catmull and John Lasseter are now basically the head of Pixar and Disney after Disney purchases them. And uh, she's talking about Disney shutting down hand-drawn uh, animation and, and focusing on 3D only, and John finding out that this idea was tragic and revamped it. Uh, maybe even saving the tradition of Disney. It, I think that's absolutely true, mm -hmm. um, that it did absolutely save the tradition, because there's an element that it has to be there. I mean, you, well, you can say that it doesn't have to be there. People want it to be there. I want it to be there. There's a hand-drawn element that should exist. Mm -hmm. So they, you know, they came back in, they said, this is still a viable, this is still a realistic art form. It should still exist. And we're going to bring it back, and not only are we going to bring it back, we're going to do Princess and the Frog. So I thought that was really kind of cool, mm -hmm. you know. To to, and I agree with uh, Catherine's comments there that, um, um, you know, when she said that that they that it was great that they brought it back, and that was one of the best things that I think once Disney bought Pixar that happened. Right. Obviously, the biggest thing is that John Lasseter and Ed Catmull were able to have their influence on that whole thing. Um, but, uh, yes, uh, Ryan Hirsch also says uh, about Newt, just jumping back there, that he says he wished it was, uh, created as well. And what do you think? Do you wish that it was created? I don't, actually. And w why not? Because I, I actually wish it was, You too. know what? I don't because, um, obviously there's a reason, and I guess I didn't get too wrapped up into the fact that, you know, I saw the artwork, and the artwork was beautiful, but, you know, if something's not working, I'm not going to dwell on, I guess, too much of something that could have been or whatnot. Yeah. I don't know. I guess I'm not broken hearted about it. Huh. Yeah, no, I would have liked to have I would have liked to have seen it myself just because I thought some of the character designs were really cool. I know that the story uh, matched along with some of the uh, the phrases of Rio, uh, but I still thought it was really uh, interesting and powerful. Um, so I'm not finding it in you know just when I'm flipping through, but inside out what I'm recalling um, is that they talk about the fact that, um, and th this was actually from the excerpt, so this is what was actually already released ahead of time. Oh, in the Fast Company article. In the Fast Company article, when they talked about that, um, you know, Pete Doctor had this grandiose idea, and, you know, Brad Bird kind of said, you know, you've got to wheel it in a little bit, you got to focus it a little bit more. But the other thing that I didn't know, um, dang it, I just had it and I lost it again. This is where I have to, I'm going to... Definitely with my notes, they're not going to be in numerical and sequential order. They're going to be by film, so I'll have to rearrange them. Um, oh, research trips. That's what it was from, research trips. So on uh, Inside Out, it's also gleaned in here that they meet with a... It's going to kill me now. Building and sustaining, Chapter 9, The Hidden Randomness, Challenges... 195. That'll get me right there. Um, yeah, just really interesting stuff as far as who they had to, uh, to to mix with. Anyways, they go inside the mind and they learn. They they are not just talking about inside the mind. Uh, they are physically talking to mind scientists that go inside the mind and, and figure out how things are uh, mapped. Working, yeah. Yeah, it's really kind of cool. Uh, Dan has a comment about Newt here. He says, I love it, uh, how it talks about Newt being given to Pete Doctor but turned down because he had a better idea inside out. Super interesting. It shows how long uh, it had been, inside out has been in the works. So that, that was part of that, uh, the Fast Company excerpt as well, and that is really interesting how um, before casting Newt off, they did try to give it to him. So that's interesting that it's written in the book that way at one point that Ed says it was really his story, it had to remain with him, 
but then I didn't even catch that. Mm -hmm. That it was really cool that it, um, it does those. That it that's the uh, that was an option. So I thought that was pretty cool. But yeah, the research trip thing, and then let's talk about um, up a little bit. So up was a completely like drastically. Uh, Completely different movie. So that was on page 149. I'm going to skip over to there real quick. Because Up w up blew my mind too. Um, how it changed so much. So, um, yeah, the, in the first version, there was a castle floating, uh, completely unconnected to the world below. So this is the original version of Up. How, which is different. Which yeah. is, I mean, and when we read this from the book, I mean, we're kind of like, what? How is that even a possibility? Because we know and we love what we've seen. Right. Now, if we didn't know what we've already seen and that we love what up is now, this wouldn't be so crazy to hear. Well, At least is, that's what I think. Well, this is where the power of the brain trust really comes in because, you know, it says, you know, they've got this castle floating in the sky. In the castle lived a king and his two sons who were vying to inherit the kingdom. The sons were opposites. They couldn't stand each other. One day they both fell to the earth, and they were wandering around trying to get back to their castle in the sky. Then they call, come across a tall bird who helped them understand each other. Whoa. How does that... Well, the tall bird stayed. So Ed says only Maybe two... Maybe one of the boys' name was Kevin. No. <laughs> only, only two things survived from the original version, the tall bird and the title up. So I thought that was really interesting. Um, so eventually they rewrite it. Pete Doctor comes back and says, "Okay, so the house lands on an abandoned Soviet area, area Soviet era spy dirigible, which uh, is essentially like a like a zeppelin, uh, something like that, an old spy plane. It's camouflaged to look like a giant cloud. Uh, much of the story unfolded on the airship until someone noted that while it worked story wise, it was." bore a slight resemblance to another idea Pixar had optioned to do with clouds. So at this point, what was that? What was the movie that Pixar had, Pixar had optioned that had to do with clouds? Partly Cloudy. When did that come out? Oh gosh, now I know. But we're talking about pre-development of Up. It could have been pre-development for Partly Cloudy. Uh, yeah. Yeah, and it just says a Pixar idea. It doesn't say a Pixar movie. So uh, that's and, the only other thing that's you know geared towards right around that, clouds that we that we're aware of that we're aware of. So, yeah. So anyways, um, the, interestingly enough, it goes around and around, but uh, it bring it comes back to the drawing board a third time. They've gotten rid of a whole bunch of different elements. They now have Carl and Russell, the tall bird, still there. The house being lifted into the sky with balloons is now there. Yeah, okay, and I was going to say this. Partly Cloudy came out with Up. Okay, yeah, and that was obviously Pete Sohn, mm -hmm. but that's interesting. So, okay, so then they talk about that they encounter a famous explorer, Charles Muntz, whom Fredrickson had read about and had been inspired about when he was a boy. This was actually brought up on our forum by Dan as well, and uh, he says, you know, how are the ages there? You know, how is Charles Muntz uh, the same age, or pretty much, or why, why isn't Charles Muntz, like, pushing 100 if Carl is, Fredrickson is, you know, now seeing him, and he's an old man, too. Mm -hmm. So anyways, the reason Muntz didn't die, this is in the, the, the third version, the reason Muntz didn't die of old age by this point was because of the aforementioned bird laid uh, the bird laid eggs and had a magical fountain of youth effect if you ate them. However, the egg mythology was complicated and got in the way of the core of the story. It felt like too much of an aside. Mm -hmm. So Pete had to uh, come back again, and uh, Catherine Anderson jumped in and said both Cloudy and Up re re released in 2009. So thank you, Catherine. Um, so now the fourth version comes out, and they basically said they got rid of the youth-providing eggs, which is... <laughs> Totally. Uh, it's silly now because we know what it was. But right. But it left us with the chronological... In that research and development phase, gosh, I would love to be in these meetings just to know where films go and where films... Just the research and development in the story department is just like, oh my gosh, that's like my wheelhouse. I would love it. <laughs> yeah, so then obviously at this point, um, the emotional through line of the, of the film was working. The age difference between Muntz and Carl was what was the problem. They were too late in the game. They decided they weren't going to fix it. 
and they weren't even going to address it. And this is where he's, they said, we found over the years that if people are enjoying the world you've created enough, they'll forgive little inconsistencies if they even notice them at all. Uh, in this case, nobody noticed, or if they did, they didn't care. Well, people noticed. I noticed, but I didn't care. Yeah, it just kind of we It just kind of went over my head, and I said, you know what? It's you know, I don't know how old he is. I you know maybe I I just kind of like let it yeah, go. Yeah, and just let it go. But it's interesting that it had come up, and you know, and even in the but book. if you if I wasn't loving the movie, you know, maybe I would have been like, hey, wait a second, but you know, like he wrote in the book, you know, if you're enjoying the world, which I was enjoying the world, I didn't think twice. Right. Uh, we can look at it now and really like go into it and like come up with all these crazy, you know, theories or whatever, but why right. bother? Yeah. Um, I, I did think it was interesting, just a couple, like, side notes that I had had, um, that, uh, you know, it, in this book, if you're looking for any type of management tips or business tips, that Ed comes in and says that he's he's completely realistic in saying that he's not going to... He's, he's explaining his views. He's not going to tell you how to fix things. He's going to explain it so that way you can determine how the best course of action is. Mm -hmm. Because a lot of management books, they do. They put the, the line in the sand that says you need to do A, B, and C. You can align your team this way. Yeah, you can't veer off from this path. You basically just have to go this path and you know not take the side roads. Right. Yeah, and then one other thing that I... Uh, you know, overall as well, is that uh, the book did not have a lot of uh, direct quotes from John Lasseter. It's not anything massive that it's not there. I just thought it was interesting because there were a lot of direct quotes and uh, citations uh, from a lot of other Pixarians. Um, so I thought that was interesting. Um, I'm trying to think of what other was, like, overall notes. Um, you know, I guess just as we kind of, you know, think through the end here... Um, there was a couple chapters that I remember uh, comments from uh, on the forum as well, and I know you looked at some of those. Mm -hmm. um, but I know Jeff uh, Kays from This Day in Pixar, he had mentioned that chapter 5 and 6, where Ed is talking about uh, the brain trust, kind of believing in Pixar, uh, fear and failure, and how it's okay, and um, you know, director changes happen, everything's going to be okay. He felt like a lot of those were in some way written to Pixar employees. Oh, okay. I thought that was an interesting... I mean, obviously, a, a lot of it... You know what? I can see that, actually. Mm -hmm. And I can see this as, like, almost an inspiration book, too, you know, for some of those, you know, for some Pixar employees and, you know, just employees in general. Right. You know, seeing those things and, you know, hearing about that. Right. Yeah, it, it, it was interesting just, you know, thinking about that because... After I went and looked back at the chapters, I couldn't look at them without thinking that that it was written to them. Yeah, now that he kind of put that into your mind, I'll have to re you know re-listen to those chapters. Yeah, so I thought that was really interesting to to hear um, because it, if you do look at those chapters, they do stand out a little bit, and there's not as many tips; there are more stories at that instance. So I did think that part was. Intriguing. Do you remember anything else that was out there from the forum that was specifically from the book or anything like that? Um, not specifically off the okay. top of my mind. Yeah. Well, obviously, we're at our time, so we don't want to hold people too much longer. I know at the, the top of the hour, you know, we had mentioned, you know, what our initial goal was for this. We strayed from that a little bit. Uh, I do, like I said, I appreciate everybody sticking in uh, and some of the people that kind of came and went. But, uh, you know, thanks again to Ryan, uh, Catherine, Dan and other people that you know chimed in that were listening online as well. Um, we're gonna do more of these. Um, we're gonna ask for some participation, so we have some video of you guys talking and chatting with us. Um, we'll also be doing more different Google Hangouts, like we said, like 20, 30 minutes ago. Um, you know, just kind of discussing you know stuff about Pixar. Right. Yeah. So if there's big Pixar news, maybe we'll just jump on and do a hangout on it rather than uh, maybe throwing it all into a specific podcast or anything like that. So, uh, but uh, either way, uh, if there's any other last comments, feel free to either, like I said, just through the through Twitter or in the Google or email comments. us, email and voicemails. That's where you guys usually get us. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So Catherine said this has been a lot of fun. Do it again soon. Uh, you guys did great. Thank you very much, Catherine. We really appreciate the yeah, comment. Yeah. Thank you. Um, and uh, yes, to everybody else that was here, you know, it's 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 great to know. Uh, 
like I said, we will, you know, we're going to change up some formats. It's great that, uh, you know, a lot of the book talks about, you know, one of the, the, the things that Andrew Stanton discusses uh, is that, um, you know, be wrong as quick as possible. If there's two hills to storm, charge one of them right away. Don't sit there and plan forever on which hill is going to be the right hill. Charge up that hill. If it's wrong, turn around and go and charge the other hill. So I think we have learned a little bit of something from here. We didn't want to sit here and plan this out forever. We wanted to actually just get it out there mm -hmm. and just do a Google Hangout, experience it, see how it goes. So I think so we charge this hill or this hill, and next time we'll go this way. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, we'll we'll go to the other hill, but you know, and then the other thing that Ed Catmull says is you can't go in between the two hills. You have to go up one of the. That other. was a different hill. <laughs> I wasn't in no, between. No, 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 no. I wasn't saying it was in <laughs> between. I'm just saying that I think that that's. Uh, that's uh, interesting to think about, you know, so it's like, it's not, you know, we have a lot of people that talk to us, you know, either through email or on our uh, podcast after that uh, with comments as well, where they talk about that they're, you know, a little fearful about releasing their artwork or they, they're a little shy about doing some certain elements and showing their work out to the public. Um, but don't be shy about it. It's okay if you screw up, mm -hmm. you know, it's not, it's not the end of the world. It's not even screwing up. It's, it's okay if things aren't necessarily perfect the first time around. That's the idea of, you know, growing and changing as time goes. So, I mean, frankly, Pixar started. John Lasseter had to go through many iterations to get Andre and Wally B to be right. Uh, Ed Catmull had to dip his hand in plaster and pull it out and rip the hairs out in order to get it right. So no matter what happens, we all learn from our experiences. So... Yeah, so we're learning from this one, and we're excited to take it to the next one. We're not going to wait too long to do another one of these as well. So certainly thanks a lot again, and uh, yes, appreciate thank you, everybody. the comments. And uh, we'll be signing off from now. If you have any other questions or comments, feel free to send us an email or message us on Twitter. All right, as usual, stay tuned to PixarPost.com all week for the latest Pixar news. Bye-bye. <laughs>